The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, let's uh, start with the uh, review and, and preview. I put a P up there because we're really looking into the Fourier part that just started this morning. Uh, but maybe, uh, and there'll be some homework from these sec early sections about the Fourier stuff. So we, maybe we should just do a few of those uh, problems or discuss um, here today, just in advance. Um, can I say one thing about MATLAB and, and the MATLAB homework first and, and maybe open a conversation about it? Um, so, so there are really uh, two different um, problems that I'm personally quite interested in. One, one is two model, I'll say model problems because they're, they're for regular uh, polygons in a circle and I'll draw an octagon again but not, but so M sides. Uh, and, and I'm interested in as m goes to infinity. And I'm interested in two different problems. So one of them is our MATLAB problem uh, minus is the Lapla Laplace's equation, uh, what was it, four? Uh, with uh, u equals zero on the circle. Okay, so that's our problem totally open for discussion. Uh, how many have started on the, oh good, okay, well then you all know more about it than I and that's great. Uh, I'd be happy to learn. So if I said everything there, yeah, we've got Poisson's equation inside, we've got u equals zero on the circle, so if the problem's well defined and the solution should be uh, one minus x squared minus y squared. No, yeah, one minus x squared minus y squared, right. Okay, so that's the correct solution. Maybe I could also tell you about the second problem that I'm interested in because it hasn't come up in class but it's very important too. It would be the eigenvalue problem. So this is problem number one, the steady state problem when you've got uh, a source and uh, you want to find out the temperature distribution. Problem number two would be the eigenvalue problem minus uxx minus uyy. I take those minuses so that the eigenvalue will be positive. So that's what the eigenvalue problem might look like. And again, let me say with u equals zero on the boundary, on the circle. Okay. So, uh, so this is, uh, you would, you person would say this is Laplace's eigenvalue problem because we have Laplace's equation. We've got eigenvalue, so it's, it, as always, it's not linear because we have two unknowns, lambdas multiplying u, uh, and we have boundary conditions. And this would describe the uh, <coughs> mo normal modes, for example, of a circular drum. If I had a drum, or a polygon drum, so if maybe I connect the, you know, to actually create, build the drum, I might fold in the sides there and have a polygon. And again, I hope that the eigenvalues of the polygon, this same, this equation in the polygon, which are not known, by the way. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, we know it only for m equals three, which would be an equilateral triangle, and m equal four, which would be a square, and those eigenvalues, because of Fourier or something, are dual, are humanly doable. But I think five on up is, uh, I may be wrong about six, but I don't, yeah, I'm not sure about m equals six. A hexagon sometimes gives you enough help, but beyond that, uh, you're on your own 
with, fi with, mat with uh, finite elements to help you. Uh, so there's a whole sequence of eigenfunctions, u and eigenvalues lambda, just the way there were in one dimension. Um, and, and on the circle, they involve Bessel. That's where Bessel, you know, he showed up. He figured out the functions, and they're not especially nice functions. You know, they're, they're uh, uh, but they're studied for centuries. Uh, Bessel functions come into that. Um, but here I have the same question. I mean, th let me just say, I, for me, this could be a Europe project if anybody was an undergraduate, or it could be a project over January or something. I, I'd like to know something about the, what happens as m goes to infinity uh, for these, for the, as the polygon approaches the circle. So I'm hoping maybe on your, some, some of the homeworks that come in, you'll, uh, if it's not too difficult, maybe it's not, to, to let m go up a bit. I, I, there is one thing that the code we're working with is linear elements, right? We're using linear finite elements, so we're not getting high accuracy. Uh, so I would really like to move up to quadratic elements, but uh, at, at least those, you remember quadratic elements would be ones where, well, first I, first I have the, well, let me draw the, the one that we've drawn in class before. This, we only have to look at one triangle, and then we cut it up into triangular elements by uh, taking some pieces here, taking the points above, which I hope are now correct on the, on the website, making those, connecting those edges, and then connecting these. Is that right? Is that our mesh? Okay, and then the, we can then, so that mesh is controlled by n, one, two, n points. So I'm inter also n is going to have to get large too to give me accuracy. And another way toward more accuracy is instead of linear elements, um, second degree. So do you remember I wrote those down? Say here's, let me, let me take that little triangle out here as a bigger triangle. It would be, it would look something like that, I guess. The, the second degree elements have those six mesh points. You remember I drew those, but we didn't really have time to uh, get further with them. The, the, um, the functions, the trial functions phi, which are one at a typical mesh point and zero at all the others, they're computable because we just have, but we, we're up to second degree, so it's a little, you know, second degree things, then the first derivatives, which come into the integrations, are linear and not constant. So, uh, a little bit harder. But uh, finite elements, linear or quadratic or higher, could be used for this problem, as we know, and for this problem. What I wanted to add that I've not mentioned in class, and I think uh, we may just not get a chance to do it, is what does the finite element method look like for an eigenvalue problem? Because eigenvalues are highly important. You know, that's, that's the way to, that's the different way to understand. Uh, there's the matrix K and its entries, but then there are the eigenvalues. And you might think, that, what do you think is the discrete eigenvalue problem copying this one? Here's my point. You, you might, your first guess would be, well, this is like K, right? This is like KU, right? Our K2DU, I should call it, maybe? Well, sorry, I'll call it K because K2D I have specifically reserved for the, for the Laplace eigenvalue, uh, I, uh, Laplace stiffness matrix on a square mesh, square mesh with triangles, the, K2D, that, that, that was one specific 
matrix for one specific mesh, and here we have a different mesh. So I, I should just call it K. Okay, I think if anybody was going to make a guess, they would say, okay, K U equal lambda U. I'll u maybe I use capital lambda because I'm using capital U. I is that, is this the, the finite element method eigenvalue problem? And if you, if you answered yes, I would have to say, well, that's a reasonable answer. But it's wrong. The eigenvalue problem, when I take the differential equation for the Laplace, Laplace's equation, with lambda u on the right side, and I go to make it, I go to do finite elements, it produces k out of this stuff, out of the weak form, all that stuff, but it produces another matrix on the right-hand side from the constant term, and we have not really mentioned it. It's the mass matrix. So this, instead of just the identity here, it's, there's a mass matrix. So that is the problem that you could do. I, I could have made a, a MATLAB project. I guess I, I bet I do it next fall, uh, right? You guys did the, the first one, this one, or, or you're or doing it now, and I'm going to pause in a minute for questions about it or, or discussion of it. But uh, this one brings in something called the mass matrix. So let me just say what those are. Uh, yeah. If I write down the entries in the mass matrix, you'll, you'll sort of get an idea of why they are. So what are the entries in the stiffness matrix? K, I, J, you remember, is the integral of the phi, I, dx, d phi, j, dx, plus d phi, I, dy, d phi, j, dy, dx dy, and that's what you're computing, and that's what that code is computing. And when phi is linear, phi linear, uh, then, then slopes are constant. So all you have to do, and that, what that code in the book is doing is figuring out what are the slopes. This thing's a constant, so uh, we just need to know the area uh, of, of, the, uh, uh, of the integration, where, where are we integrating the area triangle by triangle. Fine. That's what we're doing. That's, that's what that code is just set up to do. Now I have to tell you what is MIJ, the mass matrix. I, I just think you don't want to have, we haven't done too badly with finite elements in here. You know, we did it in 1D where we got it kind of straight, and now we're seeing what it looks like in 2D. But I had not really mentioned the mass matrix. So here it comes. The mass matrix will be the integral of phi i times phi j dx dy. It's the, it's the uh, zero order, no derivatives, just plain zero order, uh, as you'd expect from uh, the fact that the, the, the term in the continuous part is zero order. So it's this mass matrix that comes in. And maybe we could just look to see what, what would, what kind of, what, what, where will the, which entries will be zero and which will not? How sparse is it? What, what does the mass matrix look like? Uh, and uh, can we just, uh, like, uh, let me do 1D first. So there's a phi, right? There's another one. There's another one. So what do you think about the mass matrix? One phi multiplied by another phi and integrated. Uh, is it diagonal? No, because 
fee, uh, each fee overlaps the, its two neighbors. So tell me what kind of a matrix M is going to be in 1D. Tridiagonal. Tridiagonal. It'll be tridiagonal. Now, so was K. So K and M actually have non-zeros in the same places, the same sparsity pattern. But, of course, not the same numbers in there. K had like minus ones and twos or fours and minus ones. This matrix, uh, well, actually, what can you tell me about this tridiagonal matrix? When I integrate that against this, well, again, I would do it element by element because this against this, they, well, they only overlap here, right? I'll, I'll just draw the one place that they overlap. And what's the point? They're both positive. So the mass matrix is, its rows don't add to zero, its rows tend to add to one. But it's not diagonal, that's the difference. Okay, so that's, uh, I, I just felt I couldn't feel, uh, you know, I, I could, wouldn't have done a decent job in, in uh, describing finite elements if I didn't describe this, didn't mention this mass matrix. And I, maybe I better say where it comes from. Yeah, well, well eigenvalue problem, it may come number two, but that's pretty high up the list. Uh, so, so let me tell you where, where, where does this mass matrix come from? Well, uh, first let me tell you about eigenvalues of a matrix eigenvalue. Yeah, yeah. So, so the answer was, is, th is this the finite el element eigenvalue problem? Only if there's an M there. And now I want to, okay, first of all, what, what MATLAB command solves that problem? Let's just be a little practical for a moment. What, what MATLAB command gives me the, eigen, the matrix of eigenvectors, the matrix of eigenvalues would come from eig of what? If I want, this is, I'd call this the generalized eigenvalue problem. Generalized because it's got somebody over here. And it's just K apostrophe M. Or, of course, you get the same answer. Well, you get the same eigenvalues. Well, I guess the same eigenvectors, yeah. If you, or I of M inverse K, of course. If you want to do it with just one matrix, then bring M inverse over here. But M inverse, the inverse of this tridiagonal matrix is full. All, no zeros in the, in, in, in the inverse. So I, everybody would much prefer this tridiagonal, tridiagonal one. So that's how uh, MATLAB would do it. And uh, what I want to know is, back in this problem, how close do the finite element guys come to the, to the uh, on, on polygons, come to the uh, correct solution on circles? I, I'm hoping that uh, for problem one, you can maybe keep M and N equal, or maybe N, uh, maybe four times M or something, but and let them grow and see. Uh, well, for example, at the center of the circle, or, or how, how quickly do you approach the correct answer, one at the center of the circle? It's, uh, I think it's going to be a good problem. L let me open to, so I started out just talking there. What about, what about the MATLAB problem? You've made a start on it. Is it going? Uh, have you got a graph, maybe, of the, or what, what could, what's reasonable to graph, to, to give uh, Peter to, to look at? Uh, wh who's, who's done something on that MATLAB problem? That, uh, yeah, go ahead. Tell me what, what tell us all what to do. I did the triangle bisection and okay. charges U over it. Right. And, and did you? Okay. Uh, I didn't find an error that changes with 
N, I found that the error changes with M. With M more, yeah, I see. So was N, if you just fixed M like eight, and let N get, it didn't change significantly, yeah. It wouldn't, of course, converge to the right answer. It'll converge, if it does, to some kind of an answer to the, po for the polygon. Right, that's right. So, I, I, you know, as I wrote the problem, I didn't know uh, whether I dared say, let M get increased, too. But, of course, that's the real I, question. I that too, and, and what happened then? The air shrink. Okay, and now maybe it's possible to see how fast or something. That's always. I, I was thinking about making a two D plot of M versus N and graphing that. Ah, the okay, at the center. Okay, and I, can I just then I'll have m hope for more comments. Let me say one more thing. My theory is that the error at the center is quite a bit smaller than the error uh, closer to the boundary. I would be interested in an error. Uh, 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 is it fairly even? Who? Yeah. My theory is wrong. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time, but uh, and maybe if it's because it's linear. Yeah, my theory is more for better elements like these. I don't know. Okay, but I'd be interested to know. Yeah, this. Why do I think? Why do Why do I have this theory? which you guys are going to prove wrong anyway, but still, it's a, after you've proved it wrong, you won't listen to me if I tell it to you. So I, I now I'll tell it. My theory is that the, uh, error, the error around the boundary is sort of, you know, there's no error at these vertices, and then there's sort of going to be an error because the real answer is not zero along here. It's sort of near zero, but not quite, you know, there's an error. So there's errors around here from getting the, the boundary wrong, squaring it off. And, but my theory is that errors, the boundary stuff, drops off quickly as you go inside. That's why I think, you know, from those, you remember those, well, we'll see them again uh, either today or Friday, uh, those r to the nth cos nx type things that cos n, uh, cos n theta, yeah, you remember those are the typical solutions to Laplace's equation. And then, so that if, and it has some coefficient, of course, a n. And, and I look at that, that might be a piece of error. And it's way bigger when r is 1 and way smaller when r is 0. So anyway, that's sort of my theory that, that the, that if you have, like physically, you have a, a like a circular plate, and you're you're keep, you're maintaining the boundary temperature at some sort of oscillation, like near one but up and down from one. Then I think further inside, it doesn't know, it hardly knows about that oscillation. My, uh, this is my theory, that, that inside the, toward the center of the circle, it only sees kind of a average boundary temperature and not your little ups and downs. So when M is big, I expect that, that part of the air, the up and down part, to be not so significant in the center. Anyway, now that's my theory. Yeah. Are you interested in alter ego or just something else? Ah, good question. Okay, so if we only looked at the center, would would it all be the same? Would it? I mean, where if we're only looking at that one point where it, it should be one at the center, but uh, but along the thing, I I don't know. Uh, I it's, it's, if you look at both and see a significant difference in the in the behavior, I'd be interested, yeah, yeah. You know, all, all these problems are things that there's no single solution to. Yeah? What I found when I did it was that the error between the U, the 0 and 0, 
the error between one minus r squared. Ah. Oh, right. We've got slope error, too. So, yeah, I, I That's a very the significant error. one. Right? I see. Right. So, lower error. Right. So, the slope error is in there. And everybody knows then, everybody in working the problem, uh, I mentioned that the boundary conditions on this piece of pi were zero along here and normal derivative. Somehow it got printed du dh, but that was an accident. It should have been du dn. dn is zero. Uh, so Neumann conditions on the, on the thing, and then I was a little scared about that point, but I think phooey on it. It's just uh, um, don't worry about it. Um, but what I was going to say, how do you, what do you do? to take into account this du dn equals zero, this, this uh, slope condition on these long boundaries. What should you do in finite elements to, to take account for that? And the answer is, in nice one nice word, nothing. nothing. Right, nothing. Your, your finite element method should not you don't impose any condition along these boundaries. You just use the code as it is with zeros on this boundary, and, uh, and uh, it should work. Yeah, it should work. Any comments on other, other people? How, uh, what did you, did you get reasonable results? Or uh, tell me something, because you guys looked at those graphs and I have not. Uh, any? Feedback yet on those? I'm I'm happy to get email too about feedback. I mean, so all the email first of all that corrected the typos in the original coordinate position, and now that pointed out I better look at M is uh, very very welcome. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't mean that everybody has to do this. You know, if you've completed that MATLAB assignment, you never want to see it again. And, and you've kept m equal eight, it, it's okay. But if you're if you're interested to see what happens if m goes to sixteen or thirty two, I'm interested also. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So anyway, there's that's the problem we're really thinking about, and that's the problem that that is equally important. But it seemed reasonable just to do one of the two. And we were set up to do, uh, the, we have the code for the stiffness matrix. We would need a new code to, to do these, uh, these integrals. Because this will be linear times linear, uh, right? It'll be this, uh, this, I'll have to compute that one times this one. And uh, I would need new formulas that are not in the, I need formulas for this. This will be linear times linear, so I'll be integrating x squared type stuff um, and x y's because I'm in 2D and y squareds. So um, uh, it, it would take a little more code, but not much. Yeah, yeah. I think the mass. Oh, here's a question for you. Here's a question for you. Suppose I have my trial function. Vi of x. What do they add up to? Let me let me again s draw a mesh. So I've got a mesh. These are these are you know I've, I'm sorry I want to put in some more some more triangles here. Lots of triangles. Whatever. Let me get some more vertices too. Get, I'm getting in trouble. Okay, whatever. Uh, so phi i is the piecewise linear guy that is one at node i. So I've got all these different nodes. Here's oh there I need a node there. So I've got one, two, three. There's a node. There's more nodes. If I add them all up, it, this is just like in, an insight question. I've I've got all these 
ha well, you could add up these hats in 1D. Wh what's the sum of the hats in one dimension? One. Good, good, good. The sum is one. That's a, that's a nice fact that the, these guys add up to one. And now, why is it still true here in 2D that these little pyramids will add to one? Yeah, uh, that's an insight question. It's worth thinking about. Why do those pyramids add to one? Let me, uh, uh, let me leave that question for, uh, I'm thinking of it. We haven't, haven't imposed any boundary conditions yet. We've got them all, and I claim that if we add up all the pyramids, including the boundary, chopped off pyramids from the boundary, that we'll get one throughout the whole, now it'll be phi of x and y, because now I'm moving to 2D with pyramids, and I think we'll still have one. Let me give you a minute to think about that one. And then we could uh, turn to Fourier questions if you would like. We could do some problems from the, from the text. Any thoughts about this guy? Why should uh, all those little, all those individual pyramids add up to a flat roof? Why did it work here? Well, you probably, it worked because you could, you could, uh, you could see it, right, somehow. Does it still work if the uh, nodes are not equally spaced? So we've got a hat function for that guy, and a hat function for this guy, and a hat function for this guy, and uh, these, these guys are in there too. We haven't imposed anything. So those one, two, one, two, three, four, five functions, five fees, they add up to one, and why? Well, you're going to say it's obvious, but that's what professors are allowed to say. Things are obvious. You have to actually say why, which is not as easy. Uh, so uh, why do they add to one? Um, let me look inside one element. Why do the two, why do the sum of these two guys add to a flat top inside that, inside that interval? Yeah. At the end points, you've got it, because at the end, what's happening at the end points? Uh, uh, this guy, uh, one of the guys, the, the, the right guy is one, and all other guys are zero, right? And this guy is also at one, because its, it's right guy it has height one and all other is zero. So at the nodes, we are at one because of one person, really, one element. Yeah, and then? As you said, in the case of the one labeled as one, right. to the right, it's yeah. But the sum of them is, why is the sum of them always one? Why is slope zero? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the slopes cancel, right? Or we know that in between it will be a linear function. That would be one way to look at it. If I add up a, a, a linear function and a linear function, the sum is a linear function. So I'm getting a linear function, which is one at those points. So what is that function? One, right, you know, that's the straight line. So that idea will work here too. If look inside some uh, little triangle here, okay, that's got one, two, three corners, okay, and, and if I look at this sum, what is it at this corner? At, if I look at that sum at this corner, one guy is one, the one for that pyramid, and all others are zero. So the sum is one there, the sum is one there, the sum is one there, so that, so that on this blowing up this little triangle, 
This is at height one, this is at height one, this is at height one. So what's the roof? Flat. Right. Yeah. It's, it's just a nice way to see the nice property of these fees, that there's a fee for every um, uh, node, and, uh, and, and they add to one. So, yeah, so that, that's good. Okay, I've, I've said, well, I was going to say one more thing, and I am, about this eigenvalue problem, just because I'll never have a chance again. So this is, this is the, the moment to say something about the eigenvalues. Lambda, eigenvalue. Where does it, where do these, wh I, I'm answering the question, where does K come from? Where does M come from? Well, the eigenvalue is, boy, we've really got dramatic music here. Is that the Great Gates of Kiev? I think might be. Mussorgsky. They, if you like drums and b big noise, it's not music actually, but you get a lot of <laughs> noise out of it. <laughs> uh, well, of course, he know more than we do, but uh, still, he other uh, yeah. Okay, so so the eigenvalues in the matrix case for k x equal lambda m x, the eigenvalue problem. Lambda, the lowest eigenvalue, lambda lowest, it has a nice property. It's the minimum of, of sort of, a, of our energy over our other energy. This is, I just think, well, this is something you should see. That, that this, is, this, this is a quotient here. It's, it's, it's got a name called the Rayleigh quotient, and it would appear in the book. So really, I guess I'm, what I'm doing is calling your attention to something that's in the book. Uh, that, that this ratio of x transpose kx to x transpose mx, if I look over all vectors x, the, the best, the, the lowest one is the eigenvector. The best x is the eigenvector and the ratio is the eigenvalue. Right, yeah, that's, this is like my point that I wanted to mention the Rayleigh quotient. Here it is in the matrix case, and there would be similar Rayleigh quotient in the, in the continuous case. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. That, that. that in describing eigenvalues, we can talk about kx equal lambda mx like this, or we can get energy into it. And, and you remember, the whole point about finite elements is look at the energy. Look at the quadratics. Multiply things by things. That's, that's uh, you know, some, uh, it came from the weak form. It didn't come from the, from the strong form. In the differential equation here, we just have single terms. It, we got to these things through that process of, of multiplying by u's and integrating. Uh, that, that's what gave us these products, and it works also in the matrix case. Okay, uh, that was a lot of speech making about uh, uh, topics that we simply didn't have time for in, uh, in the class. I, I'm ready for any question or I'm ready to maybe do a Fourier example. Would you, would you like that? Because this is what we're, this is where we really are. Yeah, I'll even take one that'll be on the homework, just so you'll have a start. Okay. Okay. Let me take uh, a square pulse. Yeah, this is a good one, I think. Yeah, this is a good one. Uh, in, in section 4.1, there's a question for the Fourier series of a square pulse. Okay, so what does the square pulse look like? Here's minus pi to pi. Here's zero. The square pulse goes along here, up, square pulse, and down. Actually, uh, maybe the one in the, yeah, let me go to uh, L over 2. Oh, uh, um, well, I'll just go to, I'll call it H. Uh, yeah, let, let, me, let me find the, 
eigen, the, the uh, Fourier series for this function. It goes along at zero, it jumps up to one over an interval of length 2h going from minus h to h, and then back down to zero and then repeats. So, boop, 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 square pulse. What's the, f so that's my function. Uh, is that function odd or even or neither one? It's even, so I can call that C of x and figure that I'm going to use cosines for that one, right? Okay, so tell me a formula for the coefficients. The, what's the integral that I have to do? So my C of x is going to be some a naught. It's, we have to think what's a naught, and then a1 cos x, a2 cos, uh, and so on, so on, a k cos kx. Okay. What's the formula for ak? Before I plug in that function, I would like to get the formula. So I'm looking for the formula. It, 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 it's a formula to remember. So it's really, we're not wasting your time because it's, you're going to see it on the board and it'll just take a mental photograph of it. What do you think it's going to be? How am I going to get it? I'll multiply both sides of the, of the equation by cos kx, right? and I'll integrate. So, and then when I integrate, the cosines are orthogonal, just like the sines this morning. All those terms will go except for this term. When I multiply this by cos kx, I'll have cos kx squared. Here I'll have a cos kx, and here I'll have a whole lot of cos kx's, but when I integrate, all this stuff is going to disappear. The only term, well, the only one, and this will all disappear. This is it. So a k is going to be the integral of my function times cos k x dx divided by what? Divided by the integral of cos k x squared. Because I haven't, I haven't normalized things. So I don't know that that's 1, and in fact it isn't 1. So I have to remember, put that number in. Okay, so that's the formula. And that number turns out to be pi, again, if I'm integrating from minus pi to pi. Then the average value of the cosine squared is a half. It's sort of as much above 1 half as it is below a half, and so the average is a half, the interval is 2 pi, so pi. Okay, that's the formula. Please just take a mental photograph. Catch that one. All right, now I've got my particular C of x, my, my uh, square wave, square pulse. Very, very important, very important Fourier series here. Yeah. Uh, famous, famous one. Okay, so what do I have? From minus pi to pi, well, so what's my integral? Well, my integral really doesn't go from minus pi to pi because my function is mostly zero. Where does my integral go? Negative h to h, right? And in that region, what is c of x? One. So uh, now I'm just, you see, it's going to be nice. From negative h to h, where, c, where this is 1, I just have to integrate cos kx. So what do I get? Sine kx over k and the pi. So you see again that, that k is showing up in the denominator, and that's going to give me the typical decay rate of 1 over k for, uh, for, for, for functions with steps, for step functions. And now I have to evaluate this between minus pi and pi. And no, h, better be h, between minus h and h. So what do I get for that? I get sine kh, right, at the top. And what do I get at minus?
So I, now I want to subtract. What is the sine of minus kh? It's negative, right? So as I expect with uh, an even function like cosine, the am I just getting twice? I could take it from 0 to h, and, and it would give me one of them and the other one. Yeah, I think so, and divide by k pi. So those are the Fourier coefficients, except for a0. a0 has a slightly different formula because for a0, well yeah, why is a0 different? How do, how do you come up with a0? And, and what's its meaning? A0 a has a nice meaning. So this is, yeah, you, this is worth uh, having come this afternoon for. A0 will be what? Well, I could get it the same way. What will I multiply both sides by if I want to pick off A0? Just 1. It's, it's not a cosine. It's, it's the cosine of 0x. It's the 1. And then I integrate. I'm just going to get the integral from minus pi to pi of c of x times 1 divided by the integral from minus pi that to pi of 1 times 1, right? dx, sorry, that should be a little higher, dx, right? Same method. Multiplied both sides by 1, which was the very first of my orthogonal functions. Integrated, all the other integrals went, up, went away, right? The integral of cosine over a whole interval, it's periodic. You get the same at the two ends, so the difference is zero. So, so we just, the only term left was, was the constant. And now what is the integral? What's the denominator now? That was the little slight twist. Two pi. Ha, denominator is two pi. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's why it's not, yeah, it's slightly irregular. I have to divide by two pi. And now, what word would you use to describe? If I have a function and I integrate it and I divide by the length, what am I getting? There's an English word that would describe what this is. Average, thank you. Average. This is the average. And it has to be. This, this constant term is always the average. And what will it be for this? Uh, so, so this was a k. And what is it? What is a naught then? So what is, you, you can now tell me, so everybody's remembering this formula. You integrate the function and divide by the 2 pi. Now we've got a particular function. So what is the integral of that function? So what, what does this equal in the, uh, for this particular c of x. What's the area under that function c of x? 2h, right? So 2h over 2 pi, cancel the 2's. So there's the constant term, a naught is h over pi, and the, uh, and the cosine terms are, yeah, actually we're going to get something nice, a, a, a really nice way to to, to complete this will be if I put this together, put this series together. So now I'm saying that this square pulse is the constant term h over pi plus the Next term, a1, well, let's see, all these terms have 2 over pi's. Why is that? Yeah, I'm a little surprised that's h over, yeah, no, I guess that's right. 2 over pi, yeah, right. So I've got sine h, I think, and now I'm just copying this, 2 over pi, sine h, sine H, is that what I want? Over 
1. Uh, that's the coefficient of sine of cosine x, right? That was a1 was the coefficient of cosine 1x. And then a2 is the coefficient of cosine 2x. So that'll be sine 2h. K is 2, so I have a 2 down here, cosine 2x, and so on. I think that's the Fourier series. That would be the Fourier series for the square pulse. Yeah, that would be the Fourier series for the square pulse. Could I test any interesting cases? Suppose h is all the way out to pi. Yeah, suppose I take that case. Let h go all the way out to pi. Then what's my function? If h is if h equals pi, then what have I got? What have I got a graph of? Of just one. It's just a one. If h is pi, what happens? That becomes a one. And what about these other things? What is this thing when h is pi? Zero. All the other terms go away. Just it's just a sign of two pi that would go away. Yeah. So if h is pi. If, if I go out to the place where I don't have any step, but I don't have any jumps at all, because it's now all the way out there, then these terms all disappear and I just have this. And I would like to ask you, and it's got to come up on Friday too, what happens if h goes to zero? Well, let me just take h going to zero. What, what happens to this whole thing? What happens to my function as h goes to zero? It goes to zero, right? You squeeze it to nothing. And, and if h is zero, then sine h is zero, nothing. I get zero equals zero. That's, that's not interesting enough to mention on Friday. Uh, but, uh, but there is one case that's, that is important. Suppose I make the height, yeah, make a guess. Suppose I make the height. I, I make the height higher as I make the base smaller. I'm going to keep the area as one. So I'm going to, if this has a base of two h, I'm going to have a height of one over two h. So if I keep the area at one, so the height now is one over two h. So now I'm, my square pulse. I've I've divided it by two h. I've I have a 1 over 2h multiplying everything. And now if I let h go to 0, something more interesting will happen. And what, just tell me first, what will, what will you expect to happen? Delta, right, delta, delta. So I'll get, what I'll see show up will be the Fourier series for the delta function when I divide by 2h, so I, yeah, so I have sine h's over h's, and of course, what's the great fact about sine h over h as h goes to zero? It, it goes to, everybody know what that, that's the big deal. Yeah, one. Sine h is the same size as h for, for very small h and approaches one. Yeah, so we'll see the delta function uh, Friday. Okay, so you got you got a sort of mini lecture instead of a real chance to uh, ask about homework. Next Wednesday should be different because there will be a Fourier series homework, and um, be, I'll be ready to answer questions about it. Okay, thanks. <laughs>